everyone. My name is Melody Jones Pointed. And I'm the Reverend Thomas Dumermuth. And we are excited to walk the Sunrise Road together today. The Sunrise Road podcast is a podcast with conversations that connect and weave hope into the fabric of our shared lives. Thank you for joining us. And here's this week's conversation. Um, this is something new and something different. So um, welcome to the Sunrise Road podcast. This is our pilot episode, our very first episode, um, and has grown somewhat out of um, a desire to stay connected with our online community and with our, um, I don't like the word virtual, but with our online community. And uh, he's centered here, very centered in Eastridge Presbyterian Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, where we are located. But the road to our north is called the sunrise road and that just feels very prophetic for us mm-hmm. at this moment in time so mm-hmm. um want to welcome everyone to the podcast and a special welcome to our guest today our first guest author theologian uh if if you all are theologians then i also am <laughs> how about that Pastors pastor are theologians. yes <laughs> pastor um, and friend. And I'm going to let Thomas actually introduce all of the many things that you are. Yeah, I was going to say free range pastor, but that changed uh, very recently. And uh, That's right. But um, Marianne wrote a couple of books that um, are familiar to some of the folks who may be listening to our podcast. The first one uh, that I read was uh, Sabbath in the Suburbs is 10 years old. Um, and that... Believe that that turned out to be quite the bestseller and and um i know a lot of people who read that and then uh the one you wrote i i I like the term as a recovering perfectionist you you liked uh who likes backup plans to backup plans um you wrote improv and the art of living Mm -hmm. uh, about improvisation uh, as a spiritual life practice and most recently and um the the book we'll be reading together in our community uh, over the next month or two, um, Hope, a user's manual. Um, we're so glad that you're here with us and um, excited for to a conversation. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be the inaugural guest and want to bring greetings from National Capital Presbytery, where I'm a minister member and uh I don't have I don't have quite the uh, beautifully named uh, road out out front. The church I serve is on Drainsville Road, which is just sounds very um, mundane compared to yours. But um, I am glad to be on the road with you all. Hope we'll have a I know we'll have a good conversation together. Yeah, I think um, a couple of things strike me in particular about this book and what we were really drawn to is in January, things things can seem kind of overwhelming. Um, and I think we're all craving, you know, the 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 longer days instead of the shorter days. And the activities sort of change and we've just come off a great and wonderful Christmas season being able to to celebrate together. But there were was um a few things that immediately I just thought, well, you know, this really connects um with us. As Thomas mentioned, um we we did use this book at Eastridge Presbyterian Church for a study um a, f- a few years ago. And so a group from Eastridge did study it and we were or studied the Sabbath in the suburbs, which was such a great such a great read for us at the time it just really you know for people who are busy and and taking time um but you start off this book talking about a a concept kind of connected with that with being marianne the human and being supported as marianne the the human and so um you you talk about this as as the practice of being a human and and sort of what that means. I was wondering if the practice of being human has changed in the ten years since you first explored hmm. Sabbath in the suburbs. What a what a great que- what a great inaugural question of the <laughs> inaugural episode of the podcast. Wow, um, it's funny I. I I I can't believe and I'm and I'm humbled that that book that the Sabbath book is still around and is being mm-hmm. read by people. I mean the the children that I wrote about in that book, 
One of them is in college. Two of them are in high school now. And it feels in some ways like such a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing that comes to my mind is I think about how things have changed is, I mean, the Sabbath practice that we pursued as a family to me felt very imperfect. It felt like, and, and, and I, I don't judge it for that. I mean, I think that when we think about these practices, we sometimes think that we have to do them a certain way or to be holy, it looks like a certain kind of posture and a f- certain way of being in the, in the world. And this was really, uh, you know, we, we got it wrong. Sometimes we fell off the wagon, you know, we, we would sort of find our way back into Sabbath or, or we'd be there and we'd be kind of sniping at each other, you know, and so it was full of imperfections, but I feel like over the intervening years, I have come to embrace that even more. And the times when I haven't been able to embrace the imperfection, it is still nonetheless a part of our lives as parents. Um, The book, as, as those of you who are reading it will come, you'll come to see Uh, addresses a lot of things. I mean, I think it's trying to speak into the moment that we're in as a culture, when things feel very difficult, when we are, have moved out of a a three-year time of being in pandemic and isolated and, and all of that. And I think there's still some residual effects of that. Um, but also, um, dealing with mental health challenges in our family and the thing that it has helped me see in terms of thinking about Marianne, the human is, um, is that, that hope is available to us even in our imperfection, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and as much as I think hope is a muscle that we can exercise, I also think that it sometimes feels like something like we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be hopeful people and we live in a very optimistic kind of culture. And so there's this expectation that if you don't kind of turn from that pessimism into hope, if you don't kind of put the little bow on the end of the story that you're not doing it right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where Mary and the human kind of comes into play with, with what you're asking is just, it's okay just to be where you are. And, and I hope, <laughs> and every time I say, I hope in relation to the book, I catch myself and go, ah, the, the title of the book's right there. Ha ha. <laughs> but my hope is in, in people uh, experiencing the book that there are places where it's okay. If you feel hopeful, that's great. And if you don't, that there's a place for you in the book also, because I think that's very human. There are times we just don't feel hopeful. And that's okay. Yeah, I appreciate your grace because while you were talking about our imperfections and accepting our imperfections and limitations, I was we were I was interrupted by um one of my one of my little people <laughs> who needed something. So yep, thank you for your you grace. Cause um so yeah, I I do, I do think that, um, and that was another thing that I really loved in the beginning of the book. Um, you talk about uh, failure <laughs> and working with pastors. You're a coach for pastors and working with pastors who have this idea of what success means and what it means to be the pastor of a successful church and therefore a successful pastor. And that, you know, we're taught in seminary and all along the way that success isn't numbers that we attend to the spiritual, but if we are attending to the spiritual successfully, the numbers will come. And so sometimes that feels like failure when those numbers don't come, but the, you know, that just gets all, then where is your, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Um, Yeah. I think we, we think oftentimes about hope, as an equation, you know, we put Mm -hmm. certain inputs into it and we will get certain things out of it. And I, I, I'm grateful. I mean, I wrote the book in the midst of the pandemic and in some ways was trying to kind of write myself back into a sense of what hope even means when so much is out of our control. And, and now so many churches are 
you know, coming back to, I mean, whatever normal looks like, we're, we're sort of in that, that phase of new normal. And maybe some churches are looking around and saying there aren't quite as many people here as there were, you know, a few, where did people go, you know, or, or how do we even do youth group together when the, the young people were not together at a time when they really needed to build community and they don't know who the, each other are, you know? And so it's kind of, in some ways, kind of starting from scratch. And so I really wanted to peel the the layers back on this idea of success, because I think for those of us who are very capable and and kind of um, are competent at what we do, we expect to kind of go in and and things will go as as we feel like they should. And what happens when that doesn't happen? And and where do we think about hope when things don't work out the way we think they should, or maybe the way that they have in the past? How do we how do we move forward into an uncertain future? And how do we think about hope in those circumstances? I I really appreciate that image of uh, the the peeling layers back. I uh, I remember that my theology professor of systematic theology, one thing she often says is the task of theology is polishing oil, uh, old coins and uh, cleaning off the dirt and see the value that's underneath. Um, and, and to me, it really feels you doing this here with the term of hope in, in this whole book and particularly the first chapter when you all, when you, when you explain what all hope is not in your opinion, um, and kind of the the dirt that's smeared over that coin, and 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 I'm curious for you to, um, of the different aspects that you name, which one is was for you the hardest, or where you realize that's the one you, the trap you most often fall into to confuse hope with. Ooh, that's a great. That's a really great question. Um, I think that the one that I feel like the culture has most kind of inflicted on me and perhaps with other people. Well, two, I would say the sense of optimism and the sense of that hope is not optimism, that hope and optimism are not the same, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also the, and this one surprised me, but the, there's a section about that hope is not toxic positivity um, and I don't remember if that's the title, but I talk about toxic positivity in, mm -hmm. in a section of the book. And the idea behind that is, is this kind of packaged Instagrammed kind of, you know, that hope can be summed up in a, in a, just a little, a little meme that you share or, or a, a bumper sticker kind of idea of hope. And I think hope is much deeper. It's more mysterious and and on some level, I'm thinking, I've always known that. I love digging deep on stuff. I like exploring the intricacies of things. And yet even, even I have my times and my moments when I just want the little happy ending and and just to kind mm -hmm. of put a little button on this. And and I think what the book invited me to do and what I hope it invites other people to do is to hold all of that just a little more lightly and and say hope is not a direct cause and effect it's not a it's not a linear process it's something we can access even when we're in the middle of the what Ted Lasso calls the dark forest if you have if you watch that show like the the, the in between times right before the resolution comes we can still not just look forward to the hope that things will work out, but like, what does hope look like right now? Not just connected to the future. So, so those are some places where I really felt like it was very close and personal to myself. Yeah. I think it's in that passage on toxic positivity. You say hope is patient. Mm. And of course, in my mind, having shared first Corinthians 13 at many weddings, but also funerals um, and memorial services and um, having just preached on it, both Thomas and I have preached on it a, a few times on just regular Sunday mornings. And what happens to that passage if we, you know, replace love with hope 
hope is patient, hope is kind, hope never ends. Um, and I know that that's not the intention necessarily of of Paul, but when I read that, that's where my mind went is what if we cultivated hope mm-hmm. in that same way instead of thinking like, I, I hope it snows tomorrow, so I'm going to put a, do you do this in Virginia? You put a spoon or a fork underneath your pillow and you wear oh, your pajamas inside out. And pajamas you like, inside out. All I right. know that one. But yeah, yeah, I don't know, about, like, the, I don't know about the the pillow one. Yeah, but it's like an instant, you know, like in the yeah. morning. This is this is going to happen right. in the right. morning, and yeah. or this is going to happen soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't yeah. it doesn't right. always happen that way. Yeah, yeah. And I think everything that I feel like I can say about hope, maybe not everything, but a lot of things where I can say one thing about it. I can also say the exact opposite at the same time. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of paradox in this, right? Because I I agree that that I mean, as 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 Christians, we we have a long view of things, right? That that God is reconciling the world to God's self, and that who is it who said anything worth doing is going to take a long time to do, right? Um, I can't remember which theologian that was. And that is that's true, and it's also true that that hope can be a clear and and present companion with us right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't feel the need to resolve those. I think they're they're both both true, and and I I find that comforting. I think that that they're they're both when we need to just be patient, as you say, Melody, like. <sighs> It doesn't need to be resolved right now. It's just, it it is the way it is right now. And I'm going to just hold fast, right? And then other times when we need to grab the situation with both hands and say, what can I do right now to make this better? Hmm. Um, And I think hope is present in both of those extremes. I really like that that idea of the paradox because yes, I I pre-ordered your book and I was like, well, my, I'm, I'm sure we can do something with that. And then as you we were talking, what could we do in January? Um, Melody said, Yo, what about this hope book? And I said, well, I just had heard uh, Miguel de la Torre and he, and he rants against hope. And, and I was like, well, isn't that? Uh... <laughs> and I was very pleased to see that you quote him like in, in three chapters. Uh, oh, yes. In the, in the first part, it's like, oh, yeah. So this is not just something. Uh, Mikhail Tel- 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 I heard him preach in the um, Evolving Faith Conference this, this fall. And, oh, and, great. And how I he. Love uh, him. <laughs> how he really uh, says, he talks about em- embracing hopelessness as, as a way to be faithful or patient uh, and not. Mm-hmm jumping on to that kind of hope that I put quotes before that, that, that tries to resolve right away. Right. Um, yes. Yes. I was talking with a group uh, a couple of months ago about, about this and someone brought up the image of, of a chord in music and, or, <laughs> or a, um, a scale and how you want it to resolve. You want, you, you don't, I mean, our, our bodies want that, right? When, when you, um, or when you ha- hear a hymn in minor key, sometimes they'll play the last chord in major key and it just feels very satisfying, right? Whew, right. It all, it all kind of resolves in a way that feels, we just feel the comfort of that. And Miguel de la Torre really broke up on, I, I heard him at the beginning. It was the last conference I went to before the pandemic. Mm. and uh, before everything locked down. And I remember how electric the room was because what he helped a lot of, I mean, it was primarily a white audience, although he was, he said, I'm here speaking to the people of color in the room and the rest of you get to kind of listen in. But (laughs) he really critiqued the ways that hope can be used to keep people in line. And, Mm -hmm. And if you have a little bit and- um, and and you feel like if I if I do anything to advocate for more, I will lose what little I have. Then hope has domesticated you. I mean that that's kind of his. I mean you you probably heard him make a similar point, right? <laughs> and so I and he said to the group, he said, 
you know, hey, if hope works for you, that's great. For me, that's not how I get my motivation to act. For me, it is about justice and it is about doing what's right, even if we, even if it doesn't work out, like it's still the right thing to do. And, and I, and what my purpose and and my intention in writing the book and, and weaving some of his work in is, is to at least plump up the idea of what hope can be. Because I think what he's describing, I find that very hopeful. People who are uh, who are um, courageous and and maybe desperate enough to try to make things better for themselves and to, and to advocate for justice, I find that very hopeful. And he would say, well, we're not trying to provide you with hope. We're trying to make our circumstances better. And I think that's true too. Uh, and so maybe I want to redefine how we think about what hope is to include <laughs> all of that. Um, we, uh, here at Eastridge, we have a partner congregation, a sister congregation in the Makur village in South Sudan. And, um, we have some members of our community and of our, of our church who are originally from the South Sudan. Some would identify as refugees and have spent time in camps and others have come to us by by other ways, we're so blessed to have them uh, worship with us and be a part of our community. Um, but one of the things that one of them said many years ago to me after a visit home is I said, how, how are people? And um, many may have heard me say this before, but he said, they are suffering, but they do not know it. And um, in our conversations with Sharon Candle and with our mission co-workers um, who are in the South Sudan, they they say that many days hope is all there is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hope is all there is because they don't have anything else. Mm -hmm. So I agree that it's um, it's not for me. You know, their hope isn't for me and their purpose isn't for me, but um partnering together and recognizing that human connection mm -hmm. does give me mm -hmm. hope. Right. It, it does yeah. give me a very deep, um, deep hope that right. a member of our community, when the pandemic first happened and, you know, we're all sort of like reeling from it and trying to figure it out. And she said, I just keep thinking, God does not intend for us to live like this. Mm. God did not create us to live six feet apart and behind masks and God intended for us to live in community. So this, this has to end. Uh, right. <laughs> there has to be an yes. end because this is not God's intention. And I think that's sort of, for me, that's mm -hmm. the hope of, you know, communities um, and places around the world where that hope is mm -hmm. sort of, mm -hmm. you know, um, what it's, what they cling to that's right it's all that's it's it's what's left um mm -hmm. when everything else has been taken away and i and i think that's what's why ultimately i felt like i wanted to have miguel de la torre as a kind of a thread throughout the book and also acknowledge as he does i mean he's he's not being prescriptive at all like you know um that there are many marginalized communities for whom that, that hope is is the driving force. It's not what keep, what keeps them passive as as Miguel de la Torre is is concerned can happen and it certainly can. Um I I quote in the book um one of my personal heroes is Mitri Reheb who works in Bethlehem. He's a Lutheran pastor and he um he says hope is what we do. It's his it's his statement of faith, it's his mission statement for the college that he um is president of, but also the the congregation that he serves. And, and I really like that because I, I like the double meaning of hope is what we do. Because on the one hand, hope is what we do as in, like I say, pastoring is what I do. Like writing is what I do. It's what I do for a living or what I do to pay the bills or what I do to, to feel like I am providing value to the world. But it's also hope is wrapped up in literally what we do. Um, and, and I find that very empowering because we may not feel hopeful. We may not have a hopeful outlook, but when we put our, our faith into action, our, mm -hmm. our purpose okay. and our intentions into action, that makes hope happen. It's literally enacted by us. And I find that very empowering because we always have a choice. We can always do something, even if it's just 
even if it's taking a nap, <laughs> because we need to take care of ourselves for the long haul. As you say, mm-hmm. Melody, it's a it's patient. So sometimes we don't need to do it all right now. We can we can take it a little step at a time. I find that comforting. Another image that really jumped out at me in, in, out of the book was the image of hope as the underdog. Yes. And and and, and I thought that was so good as opposed to hope as the 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 view from 30,000 foot it's all going to work out in the end just trust that the underdog is a very different vision it's a it's a universe that um that has an open outcome right and and um what you do matters and there's a chance and so so i i really i really was intrigued by the image and also mm-hmm. in combination with the cicadas uh in that chapter i was <laughs> laughing out loud uh, uh with yes. with that image um right. of the rising of the cicadas which uh, is yes. such a beautiful image when you talk about it abstractly but yeah. he really he really was laughing out loud i can i can <laughs> i can bear witness to, I, <laughs> to I that na- nature is such a it it bears witness to hope and to you know even the changing of the seasons i mean as as you say we're in the the bleak midwinter as they say and and we are holding on that this is not the end um and and i was i was telling someone this last week that you all may have have heard i mean when we talk about faith and doubt we we don't believe that faith and doubt are opposites right that doubt is a part of faith and that really the opposite of faith, I've heard it said, this is not original to me, is certainty, right? Because if you're certain, then you don't need faith. Uh, if you're certain, then then you just know what's going to happen and there's no faith required. And I feel like hope is is similar in the sense that if we know it's all going to work out okay, then why do we need hope? If we just... If, if we just um, if it always kind of turns out as as we expect it to, there's no need for hope. So Thomas, when you were saying like it's the underdog, it's that it's that minority report that says, boy, it looks really bad right now, but this is not the end. This is, you know, and so it's it's a virtue that we can cling to and and live out in our lives, and and that to me is um, is part of why I see it as that that underdog. You know, if it were overpowering and and always prevailing then we wouldn't need we wouldn't need it it would just be the way things are but things often look hopeless and and yet that that just means that hope is is still there just kind of quietly simmering below the surface and we have to look for it yeah, the thing about the cicadas though <laughs> <laughs> they bury 17 years between yeah. isn't that like the mega the mega hatch or whatever is like every right. 17 every years 17 years like yeah. hope takes us that long i also um i have fig trees you can't see them but i have fig trees um that i recently acquired we did a right. sermon series last fall on um tree stories in in the bible and um part of that there's yeah. a lot of fig trees and so yes. i was like i want some fig trees but they're dormant and i am so worried mm-hmm. about these fig right. trees because they're right. dormant and i'm like i'm watering them i don't know if this is doing good or harm mm-hmm. or like what can i do to be nurturing these trees yes. that i hope survive and right. it is a practice of cultivation um through a winter but then you think about cicadas and 17 years yeah. they bury, you know, it, before they reemerge. That's it boggles the mind. And it's such a weird, as I say in, in that section of the book, like 17. Like it's not 10, it's not five. I mean, it's not this number that we're used to kind of thinking of as a as a, a number of wholeness, you know, like right. seven, um, even twelve. Like that twelve has a kind of uh, mm-hmm. a, auspicious sort of meaning to it, but no, just seventeen. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I have a friend, a uh, loved one actually, who, um, I was having a really tough week a couple of months ago and she sent me, it is a, it's encased in wax and it's a bulb. It's a, a mm-hmm. lily bulb. And, um, 
in and I and she said all you have to do is put it in the window. It has all mm-hmm. of the water that it needs. It just needs sun. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. There's got to be like I need to do something, right? There has to mm-hmm. be something that I I need to do to this. And she said, no, you don't have to do a thing. And I put it in the window and and like you, I I just thought nothing is going to happen. It it just looks I mean, it just looks like a ball of red wax and you can there's a little thing sticking up out of the top like a little plug um that clearly looks organic but i'm like there's no way that this thing's going to bloom and just one little bit at a time it started to kind of protrude up out of this you know ball of wax and um i I can bring it over and show it to you um but it's it's bloomed in the last Mm -hmm. week and you're right it's I, I, there's times when we can, I mean, if you overwater it, that's not good for it. If you underwater mm-hmm. it, I mean, as you wait for these fig trees to, to move out of dormancy, sometimes we can, um, we can neglect it too much. And other times we can baby it so much that we mm-hmm. do it harm. So finding that right balance of what's ours to do and what do we just need to wait on mm-hmm. the time to ripen and for it to be the right time is really hard work. Mm-hmm. So. For sure. Um, there was something else that you said in the book, and I want to um, talk a little bit about the nature of your relationship with Thomas before we read this book, um, because many um, who are listening and who are a part of our community may not know that you did coach Thomas um, early on and during the pandemic. And um, Thomas and I, I, I think we're still friends as well as colleagues. Um, We've weathered the pandemic. And I remember a lot of those days, they were really hard for both of us. Um, And Thomas latched on to something that he kind of couldn't let go of. And then um, he took it to the session and it happened. And it was with your encouragement. So wanted to share with you that um, thank you for this idea and encouraging Thomas with this idea for the Nebraska um, coronavirus Bible, um, an initiative that was shared throughout many different places in the world. Um, We are still working on, he is still working on that. I would like to take some credit for it, but I I like did what many people did. I wrote a couple of chapters and mine were turned in late because that's my, that's my style. I love it. Um, But I did write the underwear chapter of Jeremiah because that was important of the burying the underwear in Jeremiah. But um, it resonated with me that that was an idea of something that you said in the book is that um, the fear of failure um, should actually make us that that's when we know that we need to do something. Uh, if something is so important to us mm, that we mm. don't want to fail, yeah, yeah, that's a cue that we should be like, you know, this is this is important to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's that's right. where you know that that call and that yes. urge inside of us is sort right. of going. So um, when we connect that with hope. Um, Another thing you you said in the book is you talk about, and Thomas was the one who pointed this out to me, so this is um, hopefully collegiality at, at its best, um, about a, a group, it's on page 50, um, a, a group of um, pastors and churches that joined together for some justice work, mm-hmm. and they started small with a dental clinic. Yes. Um, and yes. and um, there's a connection there for me with like, being passionate about something and wanting it to be successful. Um, But the, having that outcome, not measurable, but you know, that sort of passion for like, Mm -hmm. why do we engage with these things and where is the hope and what are we really working towards? There's not really a question in there. I realize Mm -hmm. that's okay. That's Yeah. I, I, I think um, the the section that you're referring to is uh, talking about, or at least what I hear in it now, I think it was in a slightly different point um, Mm -hmm. about kind of that we have, we're we're part of a chain reaction of things and that, Mm -hmm. that we, um, you know, we, we start with this, we go to this, you know, uh, I think that was the section, but, but it also, as you're talking, it really is a great example of 
that individually the actions that we pursue don't feel like they amount to much. But I think the that hope allows us to see with a different kind of vision that these things do add up and they do make a difference. And, and even a dental clinic, even if it, you know, th- this was a community organizing group that was kind of coming together. We, they wanted to work on healthcare and yes, their, their initial thing was let's work on one dental clinic for the Western part of the County. I mean, it was like very, very specific and very modest in some ways, but what an incredible place to start and then to be able to take the next step. And that's what I loved about the, uh, the project that Thomas was working on because it was a labor of love and something that I shouldn't speak for you, Thomas, but I, I, it, it's just one of those things that can't let you go. Like once you get the idea, you know, and, um, and I think I, I just look back on that time with such for all of us, for the whole world, really, um, with such affection. Um, this summer on my sabbatical, I walked with my husband. We walked the John Muir Way, which is from west to east across Scotland. And we ended up, it's named after John Muir, and it, and it ends in the town where he was born until he came over to the United States, Dunbar. And there's a museum there. And as I was researching to to walk this path, I went to the museum's website and they had during the first 100 days of the pandemic, they had a new activity that they wrote every day that people could do with their kids at home that was somehow related to the outdoors. And, and I thought someone wrote that someone created that every single day for a hundred days and they left it up on their website. And it's like, I, it was like, I got put in a time machine and went back two years because Mm. I just remembered, remember what it was like where we were just, and those of us with little kids were like looking for stuff for our kids to do. And we all kind of worked together to kind of come up with things. And, um, I don't want us to lose that. I don't want Mm -hmm. us to lose the fact that we really, in some ways, what we did was very modest, but in other ways, what we did was really profound and and gives me all kinds of hope that that we can address other challenges that we face. There is one word that that pops in my mind as, as I hear you talk uh, and to think about that time is I feel like we tinkered. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and and you had a you you had a um you made an Instagram profile where you showed the other view of preachers, what's behind the the scene, what preachers throughout the country during this time, their yes. setups and, I and so get that on. Set up again. Yeah, yeah. It was I called it pulpit supplies. And it was like the back sides of pulpits. You know how I don't know what you all have. You'll have to send me a picture sometime. But you know, <laughs> I mean you see what what the congregation sees is this wooden pulpit or whatever, and there has uh-huh. a, a light and a microphone and all these, but but sometimes behind it there's like a little cabinet and there's you know your tissues and there's a water bottle and there's like random, you know, short pencils that normally sit in the pews. And and I just find that so fascinating, the the little you know, the things that we, that we keep hidden, that we kind of need access to, you know, I, I, I guess preached in a congregation that had a, um, a birthday hat, like one of those cone shaped birthday hats inside the pulpit. And I was like, there's a story there, you know, why, Uh, why Why? exactly. (laughs) Um, but yeah, to your point about tinkering, there's always like, one book leads to the next book. And I think that the hope book is connected to the improv book because Mm -hmm. of that tinkering, right? Like what if we just tried some stuff and, Mm -hmm. and I think a, a hope less outlook says there's nothing we can do. And a hopeful outlook says, let's be creative and just tinker with some stuff. So, um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, thank you for helping me make that connection. I think those two books kind of connect to one another. Absolutely. Okay, so I, I have a story, and this has nothing to do with the book, and that, but it, this is just awesome. a story. This is just yes. a true story. Um, so we we suffer from what you're talking about behind our pulpit area. It it's a little bit of disarray, um, and behind and underneath our communion table, it's it used it it was disarray. And off and on over the years, the choir has been like, "Can you organize this?" and 
like not necessarily my not where I can put my time and yes, so many right. people are back there so like why well we recently one of our choir members was um she was she did something about it so she went and she got some beautifully and I don't know if she covered them or whatever but they're all they're boxes and they're all different boxes and the, everything is organized but she put different handles on every box and a bible verse and the bible verse is connected to the handle there's a code there's a code for this Amazing. and it's like such creative Yes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing and so delightful. And nobody can find anything because it's organized. <laughs> so every Sunday, the ushers are like, where, how do we light the candles? And I'm like, I don't know. Oh, I have no idea. But so look, it's fun. delightfully organized. And it it's just, is. it's you lovely. Know, <laughs> that does connect to that. You were saying that's just a random story, but it is not a random story because that connects to one of the, I mean, it make what makes me think of a section of the book. Um, where we, uh, I don't remember what which what it's called or even which which of the six sections it's in, but the idea that people were wanting you to do that, and that wasn't yours to do, and and how often it is that we're like somebody ought to do something about blank, you know, and you often, I mean, like Thomas with your with the the handwritten by like. Wouldn't it be cool if someone did that? And maybe you kind of hoped someone else would, but ultimately that was yours to do, right? That was, and so this person who was like, I'm going to clean this up and I'm going to put handles and and be whimsical with it too, in addition to being, you know, organized and at least in her her version of what organized is, it's so, it's so delightful. Like, I mean, to use the cliche, we are the ones we've been waiting for, right? I mean, this mm. is, this is ours. Um and Teresa Aval of Avila says, you know, Christ has no hands but your hands, but our hands. I mean, all all of ours. So no need to wait. Let's just do it. Yeah. Tidy up that communion table <laughs> or whatever it is. So yeah. Great. Yeah. I um I really appreciate that. And because my I very often feel like well, I, I just know that I can't do these things alone. And I have said for a long time, I really am so thankful for the entire staff of, of this congregation, but also for this community and for their ability to work together. Because I think, you know, that that is the hope of the body of Christ in the world is is that it's not up to any one of us, but if all of us come together, that is that that gives me great hope if we can all see it mm -hmm. um i absolutely one of my favorite bands is um christian bands is ren collective um in part because my husband's from northern ireland and so i i do like the accents but um <laughs> but um i love their song build your kingdom here and we've sung it here in this community you know the we were made for so much more than this and i just mm -hmm. see the groanings of that in communities around the world. We were made for so much more mm. than this. And how are we going to get there if it's up to me? We're not. Right. right. <laughs> we're not. Yes. So well said. <laughs> so well said. Yeah, absolutely. Each of us finding that little corner of, of the work to be done, whether it's mm -hmm. cleaning up behind the table or, um, planning a dental clinic or transcribing God's word into, you know, with our own hands. I mean, what I loved about that project, just not to keep going back to that, but um, it was just so, it's so tactile, right? Mm. I mean, there, there's a section in the book about how, how hope lives in the body. And, and in some ways, I mean, that's the, I've been talking to groups and sometimes that's a, that's a tough one for people to get their heads around. Um, especially us Presbyterians who like to think of hope as the thing that happens mm -hmm. like right here, um, that hope is lived out in what we do and, and it's our own imperfect bodies that are vehicles and, and, and containers for hope. Um, but, but yeah, just writing it out anyway, I, I just was so honored to just be a little piece of, um, 
a conversation partner, if nothing else, as, as that was coming together. So it's a beautiful yeah. thing. I, I do have one more question, and maybe that would actually would have been an, an entrance question. I saw your subtitle, uh, a user's manual, and I still yes. keep coming back to that. Uh, for one, that it is focused on on the doing, on, on the practicality. Um, um, but then I, I'm one. I was wondering, are, are you a person who who reads the user's manuals? And <laughs> and uh, it uh, related to that question is um, who. Who 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 needs to read this book? Who oh, is this book yes. for? Right, right. Um, do I read users' manuals? You know, it's it's funny. I think everything's on YouTube now, so so we get to kind of go to exactly what we need. I need this specific <laughs> solution, right? And we can watch someone go through it. And so maybe that's what this maybe that's what this book actually is. It it, it and it's kind of um, people able to sort of because I write about our own experience. I write about the experience of others, like trying to show here's what it looks like to, to try to make hope real and, and to, to, to set it up and and hold it up as a value worth, worth clinging to. Um, I think the book in terms of who um, the, the book is definitely written from my perspective as a Christian pastor but mm-hmm. you will probably notice if you have uh, not already that, I mean, there certainly is theology and scripture woven through it, but I really expand beyond that and think about how we see hope expressed in comic book movies and in the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and all the kinds of cultural things that we have a, a kind of our hands around. And I think for anyone who, you know, the, the reflections are very short. So I think it's good for people who don't need or have the bandwidth for a sustained long argument about what hope is, but can just dip into it. And you don't even need to read it sequentially. You can just open it to a random page. And and I, I don't think you need to have read what came before that page in order to find a place to, to land in it. So I hope it's user-friendly for the people who encounter it and um, inspiring as well as practical. I really tried to, to bridge both of those to give people something they can do with it. There's little questions at the end of each reflection and then practices that you can try, but also to just breathe into what I hope is a little bit of truth about what hope is about and that that is some su- su- sustenance for the journey. Well, I think we're um, we're definitely looking forward to exploring this as a community through this podcast, and it is our inaugural podcast, so Yay. that's <laughs> really exciting. But we have a number of really exciting guests uh, lined up to come on to talk with us about what it means, um, this idea that hope lives in the body. We're going to explore that and and yeah. figure out what that means and talk to some folks uh, from our community that, that we feel are um, have something to say about that um, hope as a storyteller um, and and the the story how how hope tells a story so um, I you know I think a lot of the individual sections were we're really hoping hoping um, can help to get us through uh, this time of year you know there's still a part of me um, having gone through Christmas now um, there's still this part of me that that thinks, you know, this is really the first time in three years that we've been able to, um, in January, the last couple of years hasn't necessarily been great times. Mm -hmm. Um, but having said all that, I have hope Mm -hmm. (laughs) that this, this winter isn't going to be that way because we are resilient and Mm -hmm. that's a word you use in the book we are we are resilient um and and we 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 will god god does not intend for us to live this way Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. that and that's that's yeah the hope we're working for so amen well said well said well i i wish you all the best and 
uh, I hope that this uh, book, what I what I often tell people when they ask me to sign it, I, I write, you know, I hope this book is a good companion for you. I say mm-hmm. that with with all of my books. And so may it just be a the companion that you all need as you all will companion one another through talking about these things. And I'm I'm really grateful for the chance to talk with both of you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank and you. Um, we have no idea how to sign off. So <laughs> because it's our first, it's our pilot episode. We have, we, we are working on a number of things like five catchy questions to answer and right. all of those things. But for now, yep. we'll just say thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and God you bless will be you so tinkering, much. Tinkering, right? Didn't we talk about that? That's a part tinkering. of this. Yeah. <clears throat> We're going to be tinkering. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Good. Good. <laughs> Peace be with you both. <laughs> yeah. Peace be with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sunrise Road Podcast. Our podcast is hosted by me, Thomas Dubermoo. And me, Melody jones Poynton, And it is edited by Vince Rule. The Sunrise Road Podcast is the ministry of East Ridge Presbyterian Church. Please like and subscribe and leave a review.